Diversification has become somewhat of a buzzword in Nigeria over the past several years. That's because since the discovery of crude oil in 1956, most of the country's efforts have gone to extracting as much crude oil as possible and making as much money from that crude. But this has come at the detriment of Nigeria's economy. Accounting for about 57% of Nigeria's GDP from 1960 to 1969, agriculture was once the mainstay of the country's economy. And then it was pushed aside. Recently, while speaking on Nigeria's 2023 budget, the Minister of Finance, Budget and National Planning, Zainab Ahmed, said that the largest economy in Africa has successfully transformed from an oil-dependent mono-economy into a diversified economy. Nigeria's non-oil sector is expected to generate about 8.2 trillion naira in 2023. That's about 78% of the total revenue estimate of 10.49 trillion naira. But just how diversified is Nigeria's economy? And what does diversification mean for Africa's largest economy? Joining me now is Wilson Erumebo, Senior Economist for the Nigerian Economic Summit Group. Wilson, welcome to Business Edge. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. So at the 2023 budget presentation, Zainab Ahmed, the Minister of Finance, uh, pointed out that all revenue now accounts for around just 22% of Nigeria's total revenue and about 6.3% of the GDP. She said this in order to point out that the non-oil sector is now contributing more than the oil sector. But given the kind of year that crude oil had in 2022, was this really something that we should have been celebrating? Uh, well, um, let me say, first of all, that diversification is about building economic resilience, right? I mean, basically what it means is not putting your eggs in one basket, you know, uh, not having a case where one or two sectors you know, actually contribute to either um, the government's revenue or even GDP and, and even exports as well. So it's basically trying to have uh, more like a breadth, you know, across different sectors to ensure that um, if there's a problem in one sector, um, it won't have that much bigger uh, negative effect on the overall economy. Now, uh, diversification also needs to be discussed in, in context. And like you rightly pointed out, you know, in the, in the 2000s, for instance, that oil used to account for about 23% of Nigeria's uh, GDP, right? And that share has declined to 6%, you know, as at the, the, the last uh, NBS GDP release, you know, in 2022, that's for Q3 um, 2022. In terms of revenue, um, it used to account for about 70, 80% in the 2000s. It's now, it was even 9% in 2022. You know, um, from January to November, if you look at the figures that the minister presented during that meeting, which I uh, participated in. Now, in terms of export, oil share in export is still quite high, but again, there's still that trend of a decline. And so what we've seen is that crude oil is still quite important to Nigeria, but is not as important as it used to be, you know, back in, in, in a few decades. Now, straight to your question as to whether we should celebrate this kind of diversification, right? Diversification basically looks at shares, you know, shares of this sector to, to an economy. And the main point is we also need to look at the story behind the data, the, the story behind these shares and the movement of, of these shares as well. Now, what we've seen in the last couple of years is the fact that the value that's the actual value of crude oil, the value of crude oil sector, that's crude oil in GDP, has actually been on a downward trend. And in fact, when you look at the NBS data, you'd realize that the crude oil sector is in recession right now as we speak, and has been in recession since the second quarter of 2020. Uh, basically, it means that crude oil has never recorded any positive growth you know, for 10 consecutive quarters. So it has been declining mm. you know that's the value of crude oil um, sector in nigeria's gdp and sadly this is the time when you know oil you know averaged hundred dollar per barrel in 2022 this is a time when many oil producing countries are you know gaining from increasing oil production and also um, having these revenue inflows right so for nigeria we've not been able to produce that much right 1.16 a million dollar per barrel, uh, million barrels uh, per day is what we produce as at um, November 2022, which is way far uh, below our OPEC quota of 1.8 uh, million barrels per day. 
So that in itself, you know, is a source of concern. And why this? The main reason is, uh, you know, as we've seen in the in the news, is crude oil theft, right? Yes. I mean, you know, so so that in itself, I don't think that's something we should celebrate, especially when you look at um, countries like, say, Saudi Arabia. They recorded a budget surplus of forty billion dollars just in the first nine months or nine months of, of 2022. Meanwhile, um, Nigeria has been accumulating so much debt, uh, you know, because of lower revenue. So it's, it, I, I'm not sure this is the kind of diversification that we should be happy about. It, it almost seems like a magician's trick, which is to distract one to focus on this good thing and not focus on the fact that oil, as you said, which remains quite an important part uh, of Nigeria's overall uh, total revenue, is actually declining. And it's declining not because of external factors, but because of internal factors that any government, whether it's this one or the previous or the one to come, should be able to address. So it leads me to ask you then, do we see a situation in which oil and, of course, the move to diversify Nigeria's economy can exist side by side, can coexist? Because it appears sometimes that Nigeria tends to have laser focus. Once we see an area making money, we will face that area and then leave the other areas, unfortunately, um, avoiding them or sort of pushing them to the side. So for Nigeria, can we maintain a, a focus that is spread across all the ways in which the country can continue to make money? Absolutely, I think we can. I think um, you know it's it's not about uh, killing one to save the other, right? I, I don't think that's a good approach, you know, to diversification. And in fact, what I'm arguing for is that um, for diversification, and because we're also looking at shares, what we should have is a case where oil revenue increases, not oil revenue increases, but non-oil revenue increases faster than oil revenue. So in that way. Even if the share of oil is declining, right? Because um, again, if oil, if non-oil increases faster than oil, mm. it means that the share of oil would decline. But then that's a good story because it also means that oil production is increasing. Now, oh, if you also look at the, the the oil sector, the oil and gas sector, gas seems to be one area that you know we haven't really explored in detail. And and gas basically is what powers the European economy and, you know, different other economies across the world. So um, we've seen also the energy crisis, which, you know, had limited supply of gas um, you know, across the different countries. And this has even created so much um, pressure on inflation, you know, budget and, and all of that. So that tells you that oil um, and gas, you know, I think we still need to explore that as much as we focus on the non-oil sector. Uh, because again, the non-oil sector has not, the revenue has not grown significantly enough to be able to cover some of the budget deficits that we see in, 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 in the economy. Just this year alone, 12, almost uh, 11 trillion budget def deficit is what we're going to have in 2023, according to, to the budget. And by experience, uh, it's going to be more than that because the revenue side will always underperform. And part of it is because we are not doing what we're doing you know, to curtail some mm. of these, uh, you know, excesses in the, in the, in the sector. So I, I want to stick on something. You've said shares a number of times. You've talked, of course, about uh, exports as well. So let's look at the data. So when we look at that data, we see that while oil may account for about 30 percent of, of government's revenue, it holds more than 75 percent when it comes uh, to the share of exports, include non-oil related products. And we see that share increase about 89 percent, leaving non-oil exports at around 11 percent. So while its revenue in terms of how much it's bringing in may continue to decline, it still seems to be the major thing that Nigeria is sending out of the country. So in terms of diversifying exports as well, I want you to sort of circle back to this point in the conversation and expand it. Why is that also a main point of even the diversification of the economy being tied into the diversification of um, exports for uh, Nigeria? Yeah, so for exports, right, oil uh, and oil-related products, if you check the data, it was, uh, I think, about 89% of total export earnings, you know, um, that Nigeria, Nigeria, Nigeria got. But then export data looks basically at goods alone, right? It, ex it ex excludes uh, services. So um, while if you look at, you know, like GDP and revenue, you also have the services sector captured in those data, right? But for exports, uh, what the NBS does is to look at just goods alone. So uh, what this means is if you Includes services exports, right? The share of oil certainly will not be 89%. It's going to be 
uh, much more lower than that. So, but again, it's still quite high as it is now. And this is also a charge to the MBS to see how they can capture um, services exports and also include that you know, in, the, in the foreign trade uh, data that is often released every quarter. Wait, what now, do you mean by, but, before you go for it, what do you mean by services exports? Are we talking about Nollywood here? Sort of explain that. Absolutely. So what that means is, you know, the way we have the services sector as a share of GDP, we have the fin finance, we have the telecoms, we have arts and entertainment and all of that. I mean, and data and output that comes out of that data is being captured, you know, within, um, as, within the current data structure of the NBS. But for services export, this basically means um, some of the activities that you, are services that you provide um, to clients, customers abroad. I mean, you can look at the gig economy, the tech mm. industry, for instance. There's a lot of services exports that happens, you know, within the tech space. There are people who sit in Nigeria, deliver services to companies abroad, um, and so much money. Um, those are, um, you know, different types of services exports. There are people who, who travel, who provide um, consultancy services to, um, to people abroad. Um, so all of those data, and, and interestingly, it's this, the services sector accounts for 54% of Nigeria's economy, right? So it's the largest in terms of um, GDP structure. Um, but then, in terms of export, we haven't really um, done well, we haven't really captured that, and we don't capture it every quarter as we should, mm -hmm. just like we do with, with goods export. So that's basically um, what I mean by, by that. And so the moment we, we capture that, the share of oil certainly will, will not be 89%. It's going to reduce, Again. Um, you know, how much significant depends on also how we are able to capture the services um, sector. Now, okay. in terms of the structure of the non-oil exports, right? So if you look at, uh, say, manufacturing, which, you know, as, as we all know, is a very key important component of ev every uh, economy, right? Its share in total non-oil exports is just five. In, in total exports, rather, is just 5.2 percent, right? So, um, if if we are having just 5.2 percent exports uh, of, of manufactured goods, I mean, that's really quite low. Uh, if you then look at uh, the share of what Nigeria produces in, in terms of the manufacturing output now, and how much of that do we export? So, manufacturing export as a share of manufacturing output, I mean, it's just four percent. It's one of the the lowest, I would say, in, in 2022, it was 2%. In 2021, it was 4%, mm. right? So there's no way, I mean, there's no way, I think I should emphasize it, there, there's no way that we can build um, a strong, resilient, competitive economy with this kind of F export structure where manufacturing is just 5% of total exports. So okay. uh, my thesis here is both oil, both oil and non-oil exports needs to grow, but then, um, non-oil exports led by manufacturing needs to grow a lot more faster. Mm. Okay, and so what I'm hearing from what you're saying is that while the diversification drive is good, it's happening, it's not happening at the pace it should, and it's not happening at the depth of the economy that it also should as well. So then let me ask you, in terms of the diversification that Nigeria needs, what type of diversification does the country need? Because we're also being told by those who say we're going to diversify that the government will have to find a way to hands off many sectors, power including uh, being power uh, one of them. And in terms of that, there are also sectors. You've mentioned manufacturing already, goods as well, services that will be the sectors that will really push Nigeria's diversification drive. So what sectors should government hands off, allow the markets to sort of determine how they develop? And of course, what kind of diversification does Nigeria need? Well, to answer the later part of your question, the kind of that diversification that we need, um, first of all, diversification that creates jobs, that raises productivity and raises incomes of the citizens, right? Um, so, and then this is where the sectors then become important. Um, so what we've seen so far with the data is that, um, you know, productivity in manufacturing sector is not the highest, right, when you look at other sectors. I mean, if you look at sectors based on levels of productivity, um, agriculture often sits at the bottom, right? It's always the least productive sector in almost every economy, right, because of the nature of agriculture itself. Um, but then um, services, tradable services, which looks at IT, tech, and the high end of serv the services sector, sit at the top. Um, even the, the industrial sector sits at the top as well because you don't need 
um, as much workers in, 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 in terms of um, you know, drilling oil and all of that. But then manufacturing, it's somewhere in, it's somewhere in the middle where um, you know, productivity in the sector is not too high and then it's not so low um, you know, when you compare it with, with agriculture. So, and the beauty of manufacturing is it has the capacity to employ as much, um, much labor, right, because of the economies of skills factor. Mm. So what that means is if we focus a lot more on the manufacturing sector, right, we, we, we can solve so many problems, you know, problems of um, ex limited export earnings, mm. problems of even lower revenue because you're able to tax businesses, um, problems of lack of jobs or limited number of jobs, uh, because the sector can accommodate people, and also other problems of foreign exchange. And I've argued a lot that manufacturing sector, you know, is one of the key sectors that we need to um, focus on to address our foreign exchange problems. Now, if you look at the structure of employment in Nigeria, you'd realize that 80% of Nigerian workers are employed in sectors with lower productivity. Mm. So. I mean, almost half of Nigeria's labor workforce are employed in agriculture, according to the NBS. And then if you add tradable services, which also has some le lower levels of productivity. So you have 80%. And this means that the kind of jobs needed to generate income growth and perhaps lift many Nigerians out of poverty are not available in, in large numbers. So um, what, I'm, um, what I think we need to focus on is at the middle and high end level of productivity, looking at these sectors, manufacturing, tradable services, and seeing how we can explore, um, you know, address and open up um, these sectors for private investment. Now, finally, on this point, within the manufacturing sector, there's still a um, lack of diversification, if you were, because mm -hmm. there are 13 subsectors that the NBS produces under manufacturing. And you would see that just three of those 13 sectors account for 75% of manufacturing output. So these sectors are cement, uh, textiles, and food and beverage. So you have 10 other sectors, right, competing Bringing for nothing. just 25%. In fact, some of mm. those sectors have just contribute just 1%, 2% to total manufacturing output. You know, you have oil refining, uh, base metal, iron and steel, pharmaceuticals. These are mm. very critical sectors that can easily create jobs for millions of Nigerians. Um, okay. But then, um, yeah, so I think we can focus on these as well. And, and this is going to lead me to my final question. We see a world that's moving away from fossil fuels like crude oil, and many have started speaking about a post-oil world. For a post-oil Nigeria, if you have maybe 10 subsectors uh, in one sector that are barely bringing anything to the table, you need to start thinking about policies and interventions that will allow these sectors to flourish, to add to revenue, to employ more people, and to, of course, make your economy resilient to some of the shocks we experienced in 2022. Give me maybe two or three interventions or policies that you think will help to deepen Nigeria's economic diversification and address some of the sectoral challenges um, that we have that maybe stop us from being as great as we should. Even though Nigeria is the largest economy, there's a lot more that Nigeria can do to become an even bigger and greater economy. Um, yeah, thank you. Very interesting question. I think one of those is for us to revive, um, go back um, to the era of uh, where we have uh, we used to have industrial policies, right? Um, so the debate on this, you know, industrial policies gaining, gaining uh, prominence is um, resurfacing in many African countries. And um, also this is because of, uh, in view of the, the AFCFTA, the African Free Trade Area, uh, Continental Free Trade Area Agreement, which basically seeks to ensure one Africa and remove tariffs of, on goods of, on some, on some of, of, uh, that are being produced by some of these African countries. So um, right now, what's our industrial policy? We don't even have a specific industrial policy targeted at the manufacturing sector. So I think that's one key area that we can focus on, right? And then um, the approaches to developing the manufacturing sector, they are different to, to the industrial sector now. Um, different approaches, there's the import substitution approach, um, there's also the export-oriented approach. Um, so what we need, I think, is more of um, a revolution that needs to happen within manufacturing and exports, right? Um, in view of taking advantage of the free trade area agreement that we have, you know, signed on to that has kickstarted, right? We've seen some countries within Africa taking advantage of this, exporting goods, um, you know, to different countries, 
you know, trying to leverage on the fact that there are low tariffs or no tariffs on some of these goods. So I think part of what we need to focus on, um, there's a lot of work going on, I understand, within uh, the, the AFCFTA team, but I think we need to scale this up, right? So the next incoming uh, administration perhaps needs to focus on, on this. We need to get to a point where manufacturing is not just 9% of our GDP, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, this is, is it's pretty quite low, almost um, buttresses the argument that we are experiencing a premature um, deindustrialization, right? So we need to get to a point where manufacturing can contribute somewhere around 15 to 20% of our GDP. You can imagine the amount of jobs that will be created, but this has to be deliberate, right? It's not going to be, it's not going to happen um, yes. coincidentally. So I think that's one key area that I would um, suggest we focus on in terms of uh, policy. Um, finally, throwing money at problems, right, has not proven to be the solution because we're very quick at, you know, yeah. having interventions here and there. And most of the time, even in sectors that are heavily subsidized, that you have interventions, we don't get to see how much impact. So, so I think getting um, to attract private sector investment should be the key priority of the incoming administration. All right, Wilson, I know there's a lot more, but we had to sort of compress what we could in the time that we had. And there are conversations particularly to be had in the subsector uh, about how we can drive those sectors to become uh, better at what they do. So we'll be talking to you in the future about all of that. And of course, the MBS data that allows us to track the development in these places. Wilson, thank you so much for your time today. We'll see you sometime soon. Thank you for having me. All right. And as he said, a number of interventions and policies have been made. And Nigeria is not a country that lacks all of those. But what really has been the depth of the success of some of these interventions and policies? Nigeria's Minister of Finance says the country is now diversified because non-oil sector revenue has overtaken oil sector revenue for 2022. But is it just about the words? What really does the data say? And the data says we still have a long way to go.